Good morning. Yeah, I think uh, we're all good to start. All the best to all the uh, presenters. Just a, a small note, you don't spend too much time on your introduction and other things. Spend a lot of time on the crux of your presentation, which would be the aims and the methodologies and your results. So that, you know, that will help you to score more points when you are all presenting. All the best to all of you. We are good to go. <coughs> into your mic a very good morning to all present over here and respected chairpersons and panelists i am going oh. to uh, discuss about corneal neurotization till so far corneal neurotrophic corneal innervation plays a vital role in maintaining healthy ocular surface by promoting <coughs> uh, tear production initiating blink reflex and maintaining limbal stem cell function. Any derangement in the corneal innervation leads to a degenerative corneal condition known as neurotrophic keratopathy, the most difficult corneal condition to treat. Conventionally, most of the treatment are directed to prevent epithelial breakdown rather than addressing the etiology. So what happens next is perpetuation of the disease. From this very notion arises a concept of corneal neurotization that involves the transfer of healthy sensory nerve exons yeah, yeah. to the affected cornea. Neurotrophic keratopathy caused by the viral keratitis, impairment of the trigeminal nerve following intracranial space occupying lesion or neurosurgical insert in patients more than 18 years were enrolled after excluding lead malposition or any history suggestive of peripheral neuropathy. We enrolled 11 eyes of unilateral neurotrophic keratopathy not responding to the medical measures meeting inclusion criteria and at least six month follow up. <laughs> For corneal neurotization, we required the two nerves, sensory donor nerve and interpositional yeah. nerve graft to sandwich between the donor nerve and affected cornea. Ideally, sensory donor nerve should be in close proximity to the affected cornea. So supratrochlear and supraorbital nerve are preferred. A very important point to consider is the number of exons available for neurotization. It has been seen that 900 myelinated exons were required for motor facial nerve reanimation. So the same number was extrapolated by the Terzis et al. for neurotization and favorably supratrochlear nerve have more than 2000 myelinated exons. So supratrochlear nerve was preferred. Sural nerve was selected as interpositional nerve graft because it is superficially located, has highest number of the fascicles, easy to harvest, and desired length can be obtained with minimum donor side morbidity. Another important point I would like to acknowledge is the caliber of the diameter. Interpositional nerve grafted diameter is larger than the donor sensory nerve, so we prefer end to side coaptation. Short video of the same. Sural nerve was harvested 2 cm posterior and proximal to the lateral milloline. It was dissected upward and the desired length was cut down. The judges are not mentioned here, no? No, but they are telling it is judging. Sub-row incision was made on either side. Supratrochlear nerve was assessed on the non-affected side. Initially, superficial branches were identified. It was traced downward medially at periosteum to identify the confluence. Neurovascular bundle help in confirmation of supratrochlear nerve. Supratrochlear nerve was secured. Tunnel was made across the nasal bridge and the reverse sural nerve was tunneled across the nasal bridge through, through blepharotomy into the superior phonics. 360 degree conjunctival paratomy was performed. Apineurium was separated to identify the fascicles and individual fascicles were secured around the limbus after the surface parameters at one month follow-up predominantly corneal staining score that explained for improvement in nk grade and as the corneal clarity improves the best corrected visual acuity significantly improved at three month follow-up so this improvement is reflected with corneal innervation the timeline graph of the corneal ray innervation showed a progressive and significant improvement in sensation at follow-up 
Similarly, subbasal nerve fiber density <coughs> also get increased, and we reported a chronological order of corneal reinnervation commenced with increase in subbasal nerve fiber length at one month, perception of the corneal sensation as early as three months, and increase in subbasal nerve fiber <coughs> density at six months. So in nutshell, there is no established guideline Do as to when questions. patients should be offered treatment. Some authors advocate early corneal neurotization to prevent the corneal scarring and avoiding need for PK or other ocular surface surgeries. Post-operative corneal sensitivity is not influenced by the number of the nerve bundles used during neurotization. So we advocate efficacy of the corneal neurotization in treating underlying pathology and substantiate potential use of this technique. Thanks for, thank you for patience listening. Okay. Anything you want to ask? You ask one question. Excellent presentation, Dr. Saini. You Thank are the you presenting are. author, no? Yes. Yeah. How many cases you were and showing? We enrolled 11 patients, 11 okay. eyes. Okay. And what is the follow up? My follow up, maximum follow up is one year. Nine out of 11 patients have completed six month follow up, and uh, the two patients are still to complete one year. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Thank you, ma so, did you observe any problem in the other eye? No, ma'am. Other eye, because we have performed end to side coaptation. As such, we are not doing direct to direct coaptation. So, there is no sensory loss in the cutaneous territory of the supratrochlear nerve. So, it was perfectly yes, all right. Yes, Other eye is absolutely normal. Okay. And we have the next presenter ready on the dais while we are having discussion so that we can save time. Yeah. Yes, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Ashish Mahunda here to present umbilical cord patch grafting in corneal perforation and desmetosil, a novel approach. I have no financial interest. Globally, one million persons are blind due to corneal opacity. We generally do keratoplasty in the treatment of corneal opacity, but in COVID pandemic situation, 50% decrease in corneal donation has been noted. Previously, amniotic membrane has been used for the corneal reconstruction for past two decades. Now, umbilical cord is in limelight, which is almost similar one, structure as amniotic yeah. membrane, but it has subamnion and mesenchymal cells are isolated from this. This study is aimed to evaluate <coughs> the clinical outcome of the umbilical cord patch grafting in deep corneal uh, ulcer due to the perforation and desmetosil. For that, we have done a prospective randomized, a non-randomized intervental single arm, single center study with 48 subjects, and each subject were participated for six months, and the whole study was uh, durated for one and a half years. The study has three phases. From 18 to 65 year old patients of any gender with corneal perforation and desmetosil due to infectious, non-infectious and trauma with the perforation size of 3.5 to 4.5 millimeter with no prior history of keratoplasty has been included in this study. Uh, <clears throat> as an outcome, we have taken graft host integration time corneal thickness over the time period, re-epithelialization time, improvement in the visual equity, and anterior chamber depth. As an intervention procedure, first, the video is not working. Uh, first, the thickness, uh, the, uh, the size of the defect has been measured, and then the twice of the size has been cut out from the dried umbilical cord and then it is shaped in a circular manner and placed over the cornea. Then it is soaked with balancol solution and attached with uh, 8 tensile monofilament nylon. And then the anterior chamber is filled with air and balance also, uh, and BCL is placed. As a result, in this case, you can see a patient came with a desmetosil with vascularization. This patient has undergone umbilical cord patch grafting. Post-op three months, there is no vascularization and graft host integration is good. And post-op six months, graft is getting clearer and clearer. In the similar case, this patient has come with trauma with 4.5 millimeter defect, has undergone umbilical cord patch grafting. Post-op six months, the graft host integration is good. And then this patient has undergone cat cataract surgery and the post-op cataract surgery vision is 624 aided. 
In this serial pictograph, you can see in the post of three wigs, there is a re-epithelialization, which is also uh, seen in the uh, slit lamp examination with fluorescent. In the, this serial picture, in post of three months, there is a clear demarcation line between graft and host, whereas in post of six months, there is no clear demarcation line between graft and host. One patient had undergone keratoplasty and uh, lenticule was sent for the histopathology where it is shown that there is epithelial hyperplasia, granulation tissue, compact collagen of umbilical cord and beneath that there is newly formed collagen tissue is uh, pre uh, presenting uh, in these cases. The mean re-epithelialization time is 19 days whereas mean graft host integration time is 84 days. The mean umbilical cord patch graft after three months is 206 micron whereas after this there is no clear demarcation line so could not be assessed further but after post-ops six months the mean corneal thickness is 412 micron. There is no change in visual acuity in the time period cause this purpose the purpose of the study is for the tectonic usage but in case of peripheral uh, disease there is improvement. There is no change in anterior chamber depth. That means the anterior chamber structure is stable. Complication what we noted that one patient had developed hypopion, one pa uh, two patient has developed vascularization and one patient had developed corneal thinning. As a conclusion, we can say that umbilical cord patch grafting give a good tectonic support in the case of corneal perforation and desmetosyl. It helps in healing the inflammation and graft host integration is very good. As a limitation, I can say the number of the sample size should be more and the follow-up period for this patient should be more to see any late complications. These are my references. Thank you. Order, no? You are the presenting order? Yes. And uh, what is the difference between the sample cord patching and uh, amniotic membrane you feel? Ma'am, in case of uh, amniotic membrane, uh, the thickness of amniotic membrane is approximately 50 micron and in case of umbilical cord, it, it, it varies upon cutting of the umbilical cord, it varies from 200 to uh, 150 micron and if we, uh, it also has sub-amnion uh, with the amniotic membrane, amnion part. The suturing, it will be slightly thicker. Uh, it is thicker it is than there. the amniotic. Membrane. The cut throughing won't be there. And what about the cost? What, what about the optical? If it is in the central area, will it clear up? No, ma'am. Uh, the thing is, uh, this purpose of the uh, surgery is totally due to the tech, uh, for the tectonic purpose. Because at the time of COVID pandemic situation, we were running out of the cornea. So we were looking for some uh, other structure what we can use for the, especially the uh, uh, desmetosyl and the corneal perforation. So here we get this uh, umbilical cord to use for the tectonic sub purpose. How did, how did you harvest it, the umbilical cord? Um, so I have no uh, financial interest, but uh, the thing is uh, we, ha we don't harvest it. There is a um, company uh, who provide us the dried umbilical cord. It's it is commercially available right yes, now. Yes, okay. sir. This is commercially available. And, and they have DCGI approval and everything. Can you find any difference between this amniotic membrane transplantation and this umbil umbilical cord harvest uh, transplantation? Any? Uh, why did you go for this umbilical cord? Any uh, any advantage of this particular yes. modality? Yes, sir. <laughs> any advantage of umbilical cord over the amniotic membrane? Uh, sir, uh, the you are talking in context of tectonic support. Yes. You are talking in, te in context of tectonic support. Neurotrophic keratitis is something different for a tectonic support as far as tectonic support is concerned. Acha, you are just desmetosis. You are, you have harvested it for a tectonic support only. Yes. The umbilical cord instead of the amniotic membrane was har harvested for tectonic support. How long it remains inside? The, how long it remains? Uh, 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 sir, it remains uh, stable with the stable thickness of around 206 micron. Uh, 
at a, at a stretch of six to seven months. So it um, I it have done the follow up of this patient for the long time, where I have seen the gradual decrease of the thickness. I have seen after eight to nine months. It so remained inside the eye for nine months or the, over the cornea. Yes. Okay, fine. So next, uh, the presenter is Dr. Mangala and she will be presenting Minocycline, a promising drug treatment in management of thiam, thiam keratitis, pathium keratitis. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my topic is Minocycline, a promising drug treatment in the management of pathium keratitis. As we all know, pathium keratitis is a very dreadful disease and uh, it's very, it closely mimics a fungal keratitis, very difficult to diagnose. I am not going into deep into a uh, Pythium keratitis. I am going to talk about few cases where we treated uh, these cases with the uh, minocycline. So our case series were to report the successful management of uh, Pythium keratitis using a combination of minocycline and linisolid. Uh, the, all the cases were culture and uh, stain proven positive Pythium cases. Uh, we did just uh, in the period of uh, January, we started in Jan 2022 uh, from our ho own hospital, Aravindaya Hospital, Koimatur. So we took four cases, uh, out of them, the uh, youngest was 17 and the oldest was 56. Only one patient had diabetes, no other comorbidities was noted. And uh, one was female and other three were males. And uh, occupation wise, there was no uh, correlation. All were different, different kinds of occupation, housewife, conductor, manual laborer, etc. There was uh, history of trauma in one case and uh, foreign body removal in another case. And two cases, they were not able to find out any specific cause. So at the time of presentation, they had all the three had pain, defective vision and redness. Uh, these were their uh, visual acuity and um, these were the present, uh, present uh, signs at the time of presentations. All of them had all these signs, feathery, tentacular spread, ring, a typical pythium presentation. Only one patient, he was treated as a fungal uh, keratitis outside for a week. And even we didn't get that uh, initial uh, uh, scraping uh, positive, uh, was not positive for him. But other three, even the scraping was positive. Then after a week, he grew pythium. So initial microbiological evaluation, two grow pythium, one grow fungus, and one did not grow organisms. But after two, three days in culture, all the four patients uh, were positive for pythium. That's why we took these four patients for our study. So all, all the four patients were tre initial treatment uh, uh, were given by 0.2% linisolid, 1% minocycline, 1% azithromycin, and homide. Uh, oral minocycline was started for two patients and oral azithral, uh, azithromycin was uh, started for two patients. So this is a clinical course of the first patient that was a small boy who had 612. So first we all these all patients were started with medications. They were all admitted in our ward. So once we found out the tentacles were blunted, we discharged them after one week or 10 days. Then uh, uh, we were closely following up. But all the patients, we have to wait a lot of uh, long time. So uh, then we star started to notice conjunctivalization. The gutter started to form. And it was status quo for a few more visits. But we still continued our medications and uh, slowly started healing the epithelial uh, defect started to heal so this is our first patient all the patients we did confocal microscopy also and it was also proven to be positive so this uh, this was the initial presentation of the patient on february and then on due course he was um, a scarring and all the scars started and this is the final picture of the patient even though the scar looks dense and for the follow-ups he was even able to get six nine partial vision this is the second patient, the same thing, all of them had were admitted and then for him uh, ED started healing but the one thing is that patient had few follicular reactions in topicals so we have to reduce it a little bit faster but for him also uh, the uh, ulcer healed. Uh, this is a clinical picture of the second patient. He presented to us in April and we can see the gutter, all tentacular sp uh, spreads and everything. So slowly it started healing, conjunctivalization, gutter formation. And to our surprise, even it, actually I didn't get one more picture. There was a lot of vascularization, but on September even the vascularization started healing so well. And this is the third pa third patient. She is a female. She came with the initial presentation like this and uh, and on due course, we can see all the tentacles blunted and uh, scarring, conjunctivalization on all those things. 
and this is our fourth patient this is the only patient where we had to treat him for as a fungal keratitis for a week then after the uh, cultures came again we started stopped our fung anti fungals and then we restarted him on uh, uh, one person minocycline and this is the course of the patient in all these uh, four patients we can see the globe integrity is maintained even the vascularization reduced uh, either by, by the end of the treatment and they are all doing good well so future we we may go for uh, keratoplasty why we wanted to start minocycline because in our past experience we we had 16 patients where uh, where patients were receiving uh, these uh, drugs when we start, saw the patient for the first time all the patients were referred from out, many patients were referred from outside already they were on antifungals antibiotics and combination of treatments then we did our routine uh, microbiological workup and then uh, uh, we a routine treatment was started like linezolid azithromycin linezolid phmb all those routine drugs were started but unfortunately only one child had um, success in uh, managing but other 15 cases failure means they were large ulcers not able to treat and went for post tpk even in tpk we can see 11 patients went went for failed grafts and two we have to eviscerate and we had to uh, do regrafts and peripheral recurrences so we have we thought we will just go for an another protocol and then we out of literature search we went for the minocycline treatment so now we for these patients we gave minocycline linezolid azithromycin and both the treating physician as well as the patient need a lot of patience because it takes a lot of time and at least three to four months to heal completely but we were able to uh, we were able to preserve the globe this is a minocycline drug action mechanism on action actually we prepared minocycline by mixing 100 milligram of iv preparation with uh, 10 ml of sterile water and we made of uh, one person minocycline and this was given to the refrigerated and uh, uh, given to the patient so pithium keratitis is not uncommon and this drug is a promising drug so early recognition is important and uh, general ophthalmology should consider pithium as a possible differential diagnosis thank you it's a nice presentation, uh, Dr. Mangala. And uh, no, like uh, the azithromycin has been proved to be uh, very effective against these yes, organisms. Uh, so, uh, what is the advantage of this minocycline over uh, azithromycin? Yes, sir. We actually we were giving these drugs only, linezolid, azithromycin, and all. But we we in our cases we couldn't heal. Uh, many of the patients went for uh, large spread. Uh, large grafts, recurrences, and graft melts and all. So out of interest, we went for a literature search and we found out minocycline is another good promising drug. But in these four cases, sir, we could see nobody went for a perforation or everybody, when whatever present uh, initial presentation was there, they were, uh, the uh, ulcers were able to come down in that size. They were not spreading. So we thought we'll go for a drug and we tried, actually. We were giving only azithromycin before. And it worked well. No so patients. what is the shelf life of minocycline? Um, shelf life we used to keep for a week. We for mix, a week. We can and have, we'll have 10 ml. So and any a, specific precaution to get for storage of the drug? Sorry, ma'am? Any refrigeration required? Uh, yeah, we have to keep it in the refrigerator. Refrigerator. Yeah. Any specific temperature? Line? No, uh, 4 Nothing. degrees centigrade, madam. Normal refrigerator outside, it not be frozen. Outside the refrigerator, they can keep. Okay. Ma'am, this commercially available minocycline ointment can be used? Uh, that we don't know, madam. But we uh, one patient out, uh, even in this preparation, he had a lot of follicular reactions and uh, uh, ocular surface was not good. So we thought we will go only by this topical pre preparation, which we mixed with an IV drug. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One patient we had a little bit follicular reaction, and that patient had a little bit a longer time of epithelial healing. So then we had to taper, and so then. Uh, one person. Can you come this side? One person. Okay. Thank you so much. So next we have Dr. Nikita Pandey. And she will be presenting her paper on sub-400 protocol for corneal collagen cross-linking in advanced keratogonus, a pilot study. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the opportunity. So I have no financial disclosure. So we all know that resident protocol has set a minimum corneal thickness limit of 400 microns for a safe cross-linking to be performed. This excludes many thin cornea, which may actually benefit from the treatment. So to overcome the limit, uh, several modifications have been done in the recent past, which aim basically to modify the corneal thickness, either by changing the riboflavin concentration 
or by placing a contact lens above the cornea or by placing a smile lenticule or by customizing the epithelial debridement. All these uh, studies have been shown to give an inconsistent result in terms of reduced efficacy due to uh, cross-linking. To overcome this disadvantage, Dr. Hafezi et al. came up with a new protocol called Subfounded Protocol, where he modified the UV fluence instead of modifying the corneal thickness. So what is Subfounded Protocol? Basically, uh, rather than changing the pachymetry, they kept the uh, irradiation, the intensity of light same as 3 milliwatt per centimeter square, but changed the duration of irradiation according to the pachymetry to achieve the demarcation line at a fixed depth. This was the algorithm which was published by them only some five years back, and they used this uh, algorithm in their study. So we aim to evaluate this study in our in Indian population. We conducted a prospective interventional pilot study for a duration of one year and included 15 eyes of 10 patients with progressive keratoconus. Progression was just defined as patients with uh, primary ectasia in 10 to 20 years of age or uh, those who had increase in steepest keratometry by one diopter or manifest cylinder by one diopter or spherical equivalent by 0.5 diopter in the last six months. All these patients who had pachymetry less than 400 microns on corneal topography were included. We excluded those patients who were one-eyed, severe with severe corneal scarring, active keratitis or previous herpetic keratitis, any condition which interfered with epithelial healing, previous ocular uh, trauma or surgery, pregnant lactating females, more than 10 pack years of smoking, or those who were unwilling for consent. Pre-interventional workup included BCVA in log mar units, refraction boost spherical and cylindrical, slit lamp evaluation for the diagnosis, coronal topography to uh, record the thinnest coronal pachymetry and keratometry at apex, baseline ASOCT, and specular microscopy to record endothelial cell density, which was not done in the previous study. So subfunded protocol, basically, uh, we did what we did is we removed the epithelium. Alcohol-assisted epithelization, uh, depolarization was done of 8.5 mm of the cornea, followed by uh, soaking with 0.1% riboflavin in 1.1% HPMC for 30 minutes. After soaking, pachymetry was recorded. 10 such readings were taken, and thinnest pachymetry thus recorded was used to adjust the time duration of irradiation, and hence cross-linking was performed. Post-intervention evaluation included a uh, change in BCVA refraction, mean endothelial cell density, mean keratometry at apex, and mean thinnest pachymetry evaluation after one month, three months, and six months. Demarcation line depth from epithelium and its correlation with duration of irradiation was studied. Results showed most of the patients were less than 21 years of age. Four out of 10 of them were males. Change in BCVA and change in refraction was found to be statistically insignificant after uh, six months. But mean keratometry at apex changed significantly after six months. These are the few examples. And uh, mean intraoperative uh, minimum pachymetry ranged from 238 minimum to 395 micron maximum. This change again was uh, significant at the end of six months. Uh, fortunately, mean endothelial cell density did not change much at the end of six months, and insignificant correlation was found between mean ETD loss and thinnest intraoperative pachymetry at the uh, six month. The mean demarcation line distance from endothelial range is 6 to 94, and uh, uh, this correlation between DL depth and irradiation was found to be statistically significant. These are a few examples of the same. This is the graph showing the same uh, correlation. We do have result after one year follow-up as well. So uh, BCVA refraction and ethyl cell density did not change much after six months, but keratometry at apex and thinnest pachymetry did change significantly even after one year of follow-up. So out of 15 eyes, 10 patient, uh, 15 eyes of 10 patients, 14 did uh, not uh, show any progression after one year of follow-up. And hence, we can conclude that sub protocol is effective in halting progression in thin corneas of advanced keratoconus with a limitation of a uh, smaller sample size and a shorter duration of follow-up. These are my references. Thank you. Um, how thin can you go when you're doing a sub-400? Now, minimum that we did was 238 intraoperatively. That patient had 311 pachymetry. Oh, on topography map. And what are the effects on uh, um, the endothelium, which you found in your uh, SAP 400? Endothelial cell density did not change, ma'am, significantly. Yeah. Age, age, she age. You can move forward, she can send up. Ma'am, age as in uh, we included primary ectasia age group from 18 to 20 years. And after that, those who had shown progression over six months. Yeah. Those who had shown progression over six months were included. No, I didn't get you. 
I mean, uh, we included patients with progressive keratoconus. This included two groups, ma'am. Those who had primary ectasia in 10 to 20 years of age. Above 20 years of age, those who had shown progression over six months of period, like increase in steepest keratometry or increase in the uh, cylindrical value by one diopter, we included those patients, ma'am. That, that is the progression criteria. Yes, ma'am. So age by small children, will you... 10 to so 20 years. 10 to 20 yes, years, ma'am. Not less than 10. Not less than 10 years, ma'am. Sample, your sample size? It was a pilot study, sir. So we included 15 eyes. Now we have 38 uh, patients with us. Right. A little bit inadequate at the time of presentation. At the time of yeah. research. So what is the kind of haze these uh, patients developed? Uh, like uh, there was any haze? Mm -hmm. No, off? sir. Not, not mm -hmm. marked haze. Minimal haze, sir. This one. Oh, I think it would have been ideal if you had you would have compared uh, this protocol with uh, your uh, like uh, riboflavin uh, hypotonic riboflavin. Yes, sir. We are uh, planning so for that second. Would have given, yes, sir. Uh, like comparative results. Actually, sir, the first result that was published by Hafezi, Dr. Hafezi at all, did not include the safety margin. Like, uh, they had not tested whether it induced cell density changes or not. So, this uh, was required to check the safety first. So, when we have found that it's safe, we are on the way of uh, checking with hypotonic as well. The, all the cases, you have done uh, uh, ASOCT to check the yes, demarcation sir. line? Yes, sir. For the study purpose, basically, to see. Uh, yes. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you so much. And next, we invite Dr. Bhavika for a presentation on Slitlam versus Scooby Duo comparison of TBUT measurement for dry eyes. Good morning to one and all present here. I'm Dr. Bhavika Gajra from Arvindai Hospital, Coimbatore, resident. I'll be talking about Slitlam versus Scooby Doo comparison of TBUT measurement for dry eye disease. Uh, dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the tears and ocular surface that results in symptoms of ocular discomfort. Tear breakup time is one of the tests used to assess dry eye. It is, uh, it is measured by staining the ocular surface uh, to a standard fluorescence, and measuring the interval between a normal blink and the first appearing black spot using slit lamp with cobalt blue filter. We compared the repeatability of T-board measurement using standard 2% fluorescent strip on slit lamp with cobalt blue filter versus scooby doo which stands for smartphone aided cobalt blue ocular photography do it yourself it's an innovative tool made with incorporating asp which is anterior segment uh, photography with intraocular lens with a cobalt blue filter aligned on a, uh, aligned with a smartphone flash and camera and used for photographing corneas the objective of a study was to study the efficacy of scooby doo for measurement of tear breakup time to compare the repeatability of t-board measurement using 2% standard fluorescent strip on a slip lamp with cobalt blue filter versus scooby do. Ours was a prospective comparative randomized study conducted on 320 eyes over four months. Uh, the study group of patients presenting to general OPD with or without dry eye symptoms informed the written consents were obtained and uh, preliminary details were noted. This is a video showing preparation of scooby do. The materials used were chart paper, tape, intraocular lens, cobalt blue filter sheet, hole punches, scalpel, and a rural. A 1 by 8 centimeter strip was cut. Five points, uh, one centimeter apart, were marked. The three to five centimeter section was marked, and a double sided tape was placed over it. The distance between the flash and the camera was measured and marked over the four to five centimeter mark. Two punch holes were placed. The tape was removed and the IOL was placed in the first punch hole and the chart paper was folded over. The blue acrylic filter was placed in the second punch hole. Thus, Kubi is made and it is aligned over the smartphone and secured with tapes. This is how Scooby is aligned over the smartphone. Uh, it can be customized for a particular smartphone device depending on the distance between the camera and the uh, flashlight of the phone. The cost of making is a mere 300 rupees. Uh, the steps followed were a Scooby Doo set up on smartphone. Two person standard person strip is uh, impregnated with non of saline. The, the cornea is chained. The pa uh, patient is asked to blink to uh, ensure unif uniform spread. t bird measurement is noted in a dark room by measuring the interval between a normal blink and the first appearing dry spot. t bird is measured similarly on slit lamp with cobalt blue filter 30 seconds later. Excess chain is uh, wiped off. Comparison analysis of the measurement is done and the severity of dry eye is graded. This is a video showing uh, t bird measurement with scooby -Doo. The interval between the normal blink and the appearance of uh, dry spots is measured. 
results uh, the mean age of a participant was about uh, 40 years the median age was 40 years there was equal distribution in terms of sex and laterality of the participants the below table shows the comparison between mean and median values for t-bird measurement with slit lamp and scooby doo the find uh, the values were almost similar and the difference was statistically insignificant this is a scatter plot for t-bird measurement between slit lamp and scooby doo a high positive correlation of 0.97 was obtained and the correlation found to be statistically significant this is a roc curve for uh, t-bird measurement between slit lamp and scooby doo at a cutoff of more than or equal to 10 the sensitivity was 0.97 the specificity was 0.90 Thus, we conclude that the T-bird results were comparable to that of slit lamp and as reliable. The image quality was also comparable and of high quality. Uh, there are advantages of documentation and storage of images with Scooby-Doo and also these images can be used as future reference. The disadvantage is that the depth position is compromised, uh, but an experienced user can focus at various distances by moving the device back and forth. Thus, Scooby-Doo is an inexpensive, quick, convenient, portable tool. It's also cost-effective and customizable and has high sensitivity and specificity and can be used for T-bird measurement for dry eye screening and other ocular surface disorders. It's a first-of-its-kind study. It can be used for imaging uh, in immobile bedridden patient and in low resource settings when a slit lamp is not available. These are my references. Thank you. So where you have you used this cobalt blue light on the smartphone? Is yes, it slit lamp only or something else? No ma'am, we have prepared a device when we have aligned it with the IOL and the cobalt blue depending on the distance between the camera lens, uh, camera and the flashlight. So it is the same slit lamp blue filter which you have used? It's a acrylic blue filter sheet which is put on the flashlight and the light emitting will give a, a blue filter. Okay, fine. Okay, nice. Thank you. So next presentation is by Dr. Devya Giridhar, Indication and Outcomes of KPU Swap in MUKP. Good morning, uh, respected faculty. I'll be presenting on indications and outcomes of KPU Swap in modified osteoodonto keratoprosthesis. I have no financial disclosure. KPRO removal or extrusion is one of the devastating complications of KPRO surgery. This would invariably require a re-KPRO in these size, either replacing using the same KPRO or another KPRO of su suitable for the indication, collectively termed as KPRO swap. For MOKP, the options of KPRO swap include a re-MOKP, a Boston type 2 through the mucosa and its versions, or an osteo-KPRO. The choice of KPRO depends on the availability of another tooth ocular status that is presence of active leak or melt and possible estimated visual potential. The aim was to analyze and report the functional and anatomical outcome of KPRO swap in eyes in which primary MOKP had to be removed or had extruded at a tertiary eye care center over 19 years. The anatomical success was defined as the retained KPRO and the functional success a BCVA achieved better than 20 by 400. A total of 117 eyes of 112 patients underwent MPO-KP, out of which 27 eyes required a second KPRO and 7 eyes required a third KPRO. Among the indications, uh, the most common indication for second and third KPRO was Stephen Johnson syndrome followed by chemical injury. On the left side is a case of a Boston type 2 KPRO which was done following cylinder extrusion in a primary MOKP and on the right hand side is a Boston type 2 KPRO following laminar resorption in an MOKP. This is a case of a Lucia type 2 which was done following laminar resorption of a second KPRO which was again done following laminar resorption of a primary MOKP. A total of 27 eyes underwent a second KPRO which included 12 re-MOKPs, 7 Boston type 2, 6 Lucia type 2 and 1 each of Lux KPRO and Osteo KPRO. Out of these, 14 eyes retained the second KPRO, which were 2 re-MOKP, 7 Boston type 2, 4 Lucia type 2 and 1 Lux KPRO. And these KPROs were retained till the last follow-up. Out of the 13 eyes which did not retain the second KPRO, 7 eyes underwent a third KPRO, which were two Boston, 5 Boston type 2 and 2 Lucia type 2, out of which 6 eyes retained the third KPRO until the last follow-up. The pre-op visual equity was perception of light. 
Among the second KPRO, a BCBA of more than 20 by 400 was achieved in 81.48 percentage eyes. And among the third KPRO, the BCBA of more than 20 by 400 was achieved in 100 percentage of eyes. This is the kaplan meyer survival curve for anatomical and functional survival of the second KPRO. The graph on the left side is the anatomical survival, which is 88 percentage at one year and uh, 33 percentage at five years. And on the right side is the um, functional survival curve, which is 84% uh, at one year and 42% at five years. Out of the 14 eyes that retain the second KPRO, a BCV of more than 20 by 400 was achieved in 78.5% of eyes. And among the six eyes which retain the third KPRO, a BCV of more than 20 by 400 was achieved in 100% eyes. Among the complications, the retroprosthetic membrane was most commonly seen in a Boston type 2 and Lucia type 2 and a mucosa related complication was most commonly seen in a re-MOKP. Out of the 20 eyes which retained the re-K probe, a BCVA of more than 20 by 400 was achieved in 17 eyes out of which 6 eyes maintained the vision till the last follow-up. And among the, 14 eye, uh, among the remaining 14 eyes, 12 eyes maintained self-ambulatory vision till the last follow-up. Thus, a re -Pro overall helped improve the functional outcome for 31.62 months and improve the anatomical outcome for 39 months. Laminar resorption leading to K-Pro instability remains a, remains a vision threatening complication and attempts should be made to preserve anatomical integrity for simultaneous or future visual rehabilitation. k -Pro swap is a term that includes a k -Pro of the same type or exchange with another type of k -Pro for the above situation. Decision making for KPRO again depends on the availability of another suitable tooth and estimated visual potential. If the visual potential is good and there is available suitable tooth, a re-MOKP is an option. Whereas if the vision is, uh, the visual potential is questionable and lack of suitable tooth, simultaneous removal of MOKP and implantation of a type 2 Boston or its other versions through the mucosa is an option. In our series, 74 percentage of eyes that underwent a KPRO swap retain subsequent KPROs. Though only 22% maintained a BCV of more than 20 by 400 at last follow-up, another 44% retained self-ambulatory vision. A concept of re pro post-MOKP is rarely discussed in literature. Early stages of laminar resorption can be addressed using bone morphogenic protein. However, later stages require a K-Pro swap as discussed and helps to increase the duration of visual rehabilitation by a mean period of 3 years and beyond. This is facilitated by a comprehensive training in all kinds of KPRO surgery that helps enhance outcomes following MOKP in eyes requiring laminar removal. To conclude, KPRO swap in MOKP eyes with laminar resorption is a viable option to increase the structural and functional outcomes with the choice of KPRO for the re-surgery tailored to individual situations. These are my references. Thank you. Presentation, Dr. Divya. What was the interval between the uh, swap pits, one surgery and the uh, repeat surgeries? Uh, Ma'am, so that depends actually on the indication for the surgery. Uh, so if it was a, it's a patient who had uh, like a capro melt or a leak, uh, then if we, if the patient required an immediate surgery, and uh, so then we would remove the capro at the primary sitting and uh, rehabilitate the patient immediately. Uh, but if it was a patient who we had time to probably uh, harvest another tooth and plan a VMOKP, then there would be a time gap between the primary surgery. We would first uh, remove the lamina, tectonically stable the eye by doing a tectonic PK and then uh, do the surgery after the eye is stable. So it depends on the indication mm -hmm. of the, uh, the reason why we are removing the lamina. The age group of your patient? Uh, so it was between 18 to 56 years, sir, on average. Okay, thank you so much. You. Nice. So is Dr. Neet Mehta is here? Dr. Neet? Okay, so the presentation is Women's Membranes Trier after d in cases of congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy, CHED.
Uh, good morning, everyone, and respected judges. Uh, I'm Neet Mehta, and I'll be presenting this topic on women's membrane stria following DSEC in cases of CHED. Uh, so I have no financial issue. Uh, these are the abbreviations which I'll be using in my presentation. Uh, <clears throat> so CHED is a rare autosomal recessive corneal endothelial dystrophy that presents with varied range of corneal haze and opacities and it can also present with secondary corneal changes because of uh, long-standing corneal edema, edema like epithelial bullies and band-shaped keratopathy. Uh, as we know that the uh, DSEC and PK, full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, these are the two modalities which have been commonly used. Uh, while we know that the full thickness penetrating keratoplasty does provide a pristine clear corneal graft, however, it has its downfalls in terms of intraoperative complications, postoperative wound related and uh, wound dehiscence, and a close follow up that's required. Contrary to this, DSEC provides a much safer approach, and uh, it, uh, these complications are much less in those cases. So, because of that reason, uh, DSEC has quite often replaced full thickness penetrating keratoplasty in cases of CHED. Uh, so, however, it has been seen that post DSEC, around a month's time, we can see these folds that are seen over the, uh, just above the area of the uh, lenticule that has been placed. So, why does these folds occur is the cause, is the reason why uh, this paper, I'm, uh, uh, regarding this paper. So, here we describe the appearance of these unusual Bowman membrane stria post-operatively after an uncomplicated DSEC surgery in cases of CHED. Uh, so here in our study, we had 99 eyes of 66 subjects of CHED who underwent DSEC from the year 2008 to 2021. And basically, we divided the uh, patients into two groups, those which showed presence of Bowman membrane stria and those which did not. And we compared the pre and the post operative findings features in these both the groups. So basically, we had the patient demographic data, we graded the corneal opacity subjectively, we uh, measured the visual acuity based on the age appropriate method, the entire segment evaluation, intraocular pressure and fundus evaluation whenever uh, necessary. We also did the biometry, the corneal pachymetry, the densitometry and the entire segment OCT in these cases. So this is the baseline characteristics of the patients. Uh, interestingly, what we could see was the, that the, the age of surgery was much more than an average of 10.4 as compared to 7 years in cases where they did not show a Bowman membrane stria. These were the pre and the post operative anterior segment imaging characteristics which showed a decrease in the corneal curvature post operatively, decrease in the corneal thickness and a uh, much better or decreased uh, densitometry. So this is how the normal progression happens as a pre-operative which uh, we can see a ground glass opacity and development of these Bowman membrane stria generally around a, a month's time and these strias were seen to persist uh, even in the second and the third month's visit. So now coming to why these folds develop and where are they located. So the OCT and the histopathology data uh, in the case of CHED basically they reveal that these are basically presented in the, present in the entire uh, stroma or just on, at the level of the Bowman's membrane. So typical OCT of a CH, CHED case shows a definite thickening of the stroma, uh, hypertrophy of the epithelium and multiple irregularities and break at the level of the Bowman's membrane. So these are also seen in the histopathology image of the same thing. However, in cases of CHED because of the corneal edema, it acts like a pressure and it basically aligns these Bowman, uh, the Bowman folds and Bowman breaks and so it appears as if they are uh, pretty smooth. However, once the patient undergoes a DSEC surgery, uh, the cornea again gets uh, into the relative dehydrated state and that is when these Bowman's membrane folds get unmasked. So this is the post-operative uh, OCT, anterior segment OCT of the patient and here we can see that the Bowman's membrane stria, they start at the level of the Bowman's in the anterior stroma and here we can see that there is back shadowing that is seen. So uh, here from our study we came to uh, know that the Bowman's membrane stria are typically seen between 3 to 4 weeks post -op they remain unaltered throughout the post-operative course. However, in the follow-up of our almost uh, 10 to 13 years, there is a gradual decrease in the density of these folds. Almost two-thirds of the cases that were operated developed these Bowman's membrane fold. The Bowman's membrane stria was limited to the lenticular placement and so the peripheral cornea appeared to be unaffected and these did not hamper the functional recovery of the patient. 
So while DSEC seems to be a superior option, surgical option in cases of CHED, we need to keep in mind that it lacks a pristine clarity of the graft and as compared to a PK and two thirds of these patients can present with such a Bowman's membrane stria. So these are just basically wrinkles that are seen uh, due to the flattening of the cornea, rapid thinning and fragmentation due to the long standing edema and late surgical intervention could be a possible in, uh, risk factor for development of this Bowman's membrane stria. Uh, these are the references. Thank you. So what was the most important contributory factor to this Bowman membrane stria in your cases? In our case series, what we found conclusively was the age at which he, uh, the patient was operated. However, anatomically correlating with it, we were not very sure that exactly whether it is having a possible uh, correlation or not. So you like, said that the age, it was age dependent? Yeah, yeah. Any other factor which contributed to this Bowman Mins trial? Apart from the age profile apart from the age profile of the patient. Apart from the age, we were not able to find any other factor that could uh, what was the follow-up and uh, how long this uh, uh, trial uh, persisted? Uh, yeah, so the follow-up from 2008 to 2021, so the longest follow-up we had was 13 years. Average follow-up period was 7.5 years and these developed after around 3 to 4 weeks after post-operatively. So how long it persisted? It was... Uh, Around? How long it persisted? It actually persisted, persisted. for even after on the, uh, on the 13th year for follow up, there were there, but the density of these triad decreased. No, no. But they still persisted in those okay. cases which had it. You can answer from you can keep answering here. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Nice presentation. And then next presenter is Dr. Nivisha. She is presenting long-term outcome of type 1 keratoprosthesis, Boston, Lucia and Oro. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Nivisha, and I would be presenting a paper on long-term outcomes of type 1 keratoprosthesis, Boston, Lucia and Oro. We have no financial interests. Uh, so, as we all know, type 1 keratoprosthesis is used in end-stage ocular surface disorders and eyes which have failed conventional uh, corneal transplants. We have three types uh, which are available as of today. Boston type 1, which is a prototype, uh, followed by Lucia and Oro, which were built on the similar design. The aim of the study was to analyze the long-term outcomes of type 1 keratoprosthesis in a tertiary IK center over a period of 14 years. Uh, it was a retrospective interventional case series done on 87 eyes from the duration of January 2008 to 2022. Uh, medical charts were reviewed to analyze the anatomical and the functional outcomes. The anatomical success was defined as uh, Kpro retained in the eyes till the last follow-up without extrusion, evisceration, explantation or an exchange of the device. Functional success was defined as a BCV achieved of more than 6 by 60 vision in the post-operative period which is the limit for legal blindness in India. Uh, the study included uh, 80, 87 eyes of 86 patients, which underwent a total of 104 kerato, uh, K pros, including uh, 17 re K pros or secondary K pros done for various indications. The indications of the uh, KPROs in our study were majorly silicon oil induced keratopathy and chemical injuries, each of which comprised of 40% of the cases in our study. We had a long duration of follow-up with a mean of 5.5 years and a range uh, with a maximum of 14 years of follow-up. 48% uh, of the patients had uh, more than 5 years of follow-up in our study. Now coming to the uh, anatomical outcome, um, 59 out of 87 K-Pros were retained at the last follow-up, giving an anatomical success rate of 67%, as you can see in the chart. A kaplan meier survival analysis was done. As you can see on the graph and in the chart, the five-year survival rate was comparable amongst the three groups, that is Boston, Oro, and Lucia, with an over overall survival of 80% uh, at the five-year uh, post-op period. Coming to the functional outcome, uh, visual acuity of more than 6 by 60 was achieved in 61 eyes, giving a functional success rate of 70%. 31 out of these uh, 61 eyes maintained the good vision at the last follow-up. The kaplan meier graph uh, shows that the probability of achieving functional success at 5 years was comparable in the three groups of Boston, Oro and Lucia, with an overall probability of 66% of functional success. 
Uh, an indication wise analysis was also done. As you can see in the Kaplan Mia chart, that is the first chart, uh, the anatomical outcome of silicon oil induced keratopathy uh, showed a better anatomical success as compared to the others. So the five years uh, survival rate at uh, the survival rate at five years was 89% uh, for silicon oil induced keratopathy and 75% at 10 years as compared to approximately 30 and 40% at 10 years for the other indications. On the other hand, uh, the visual outcome uh, for all the indications was found to be comparable uh, in our study. But this data was not statistically significant. The anatomical outcome was stat uh, statistically significant though. Uh, we encountered multiple complications in our study, retroprosthetic membrane being the most common seen in 60% of our cases, followed by perioptic melt and leak. Endophthalmitis was seen in 6 eyes in our study. Uh, these uh, complications were managed either surgically or medically. Uh, anatomical failure uh, due to infection including uh, with or without endophthalmitis, uh, perioptic melts not resolving with uh, uh, repeated lamellar keratoplasties or extrusion necessitated a need for a secondary capro implantation. Perioptic melts was the most common cause for secondary capro implantation in our study. Out of the 57, uh, out of the 80, uh, 87 capros implanted, 59 capros were retained at the last follow-up, giving a primary success rate of 67% in our study. The 17 eyes underwent a secondary keratoprosthesis, 13 out of which were retained at the last follow-up, giving an improved uh, anatomical success rate of 82%. 82%. The retrospective nature was the uh, only limitation of our study. Uh, in comparison with the previous studies on the uh, similar uh, lines, uh, our study had a long duration of follow-up with a mean of 4.9 years, which was more than the pre that of the previous studies. The visual outcome and the primary device retention rate was comparable with the previous studies. Uh, uh, this was the first study wherein the outcomes of the three K-Pros which are available as of today was compared. In conclusion, this study highlights the anatomical and functional success rates of the three kinds of K-Pros available today and it was found that the outcomes are comparable. It also noted that the anatomical prognosis was better in silicon oil filled eyes than that for chemical injuries. Therefore, uh, when affordability or availability is a limiting factor, Oro K-Pro or Lucia K-Pro can be considered as an alternative to Boston K-Pro. Uh, these were my references. Thank you. Thank you. So, the next pre next presentation is Dr. Kavita, best paper of Rajasthan of Talmic Society, Women's Membrane Lenticule and Peripheral Ulcerative Keratitis, a novel technique. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning to all. Today, I am presenting a paper on Women's Membrane Lenticule and Peripheral Ulcerative Keratitis, a novel technique. Bowman's membrane is a second layer of cornea which is acellular 17 to 21 micron thick. It harbors subepithelial nerve plexus and obstacle to passage of microorganism. It also provides tectonic support to cornea. PUK is an immune-mediated crescent-shaped destructive inflammation of juxtalimbal conjunctiva and corneal stroma. Hallmark features of PUK is formation of peripheral gutter and stromal destruction, uh, presence of WVC laden overhanging epithelial margin and juxtalimbal conjunctival inflammation. The inflammatory condition results from host autoimmunity, peculiar anatomic and physiologic features of peripheral cornea and environmental factors. Management of PUK is multidimensional and require ulcer healing, perforation management and stopping further males by reducing inflammation. Surgical management is done by amniotic membrane, lamellar patch, banana graft and conjunctival resection. Uh, pitfalls of amniotic membrane is non-transparent and flaccid and lacks tectonic support and dissolved in two weak. Uh, thus not giving a permanent stable scaffold. Complete corneal grafting, banana graft and lamellar graft reserve for large perforation and advanced disease. Uh, corneal grafting has higher chances of rejections. Uh, Bowman's membrane lenticule is a very strong, transparent, acellular, natural and innate structure and gives a stable surface and contour for epithelial growth. It is tucked under the ulcer margin and helps in filling and healing of gutter or larger defects. It has been used for stabilization in advanced keratoconus cases and also in perforated corneal ulcers. Pathogenesis of PUK is immune mediated which activate complement pathway and leads to vasculitis and release inflammatory cells which accelerate and propagate the peripheral corneal destructive process. Triggering factors are trauma infection and prior corneal surgery. 
we studied healing of uk using bm lenticule as a substrate and estimate the improvement in best corrected visual acuity compared with pre operative values these are the inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, our study is hospital based single center prospective intervention study sample size is 30 cases all patient underwent full ophthalmological evaluation surgically we tucked the bowman's membrane underneath the ulcer edges after making a recess in anterior one third of stroma of ulcer edges the mean ophthalmogenesis time was about 2.3 weeks the mean best corrected visual acuity increased from 0.118 to 0.311 the mean uh, corneal thickness was increased from 0.26 uh, uh, 233.60 to 433.667 which is good these are the graphical representation of best corrected visual acuity and corneal thickness these are some slit lamp pictures PUK has a unique uh, disease pattern due to peculiar features of peripheral cornea. In our study, 30 patients of PUK underwent BM lenticular grafting with a high percentage of success. The mean time taken for reophthalmization after surgery was about 2.3 weeks, which is in concordance with um, a study done by Chaudhary et al., who utilized Bowman's membrane in setting of small corneal perforations. Vaughn et al. in their study observed that Bowman's layer prevented ictasia and provided cornea with safe and tensile strength, thus delaying progression in cases of keratoconus and keratoplasty. The disease arises due to cell destruction by immune mediate immune system, making it much more difficult to treat and makes it liable to recurrence even after treatment. Bowman's lenticle is stayed in tucked place, tucked in place, and giving a stable surface and contour for growing epithelium. It helps in early wound healing, inhibit vascularization, and abnormal growth of fibrovascular tissue. It also promotes nerve growth. Being largely acellular, it does not incite any foreign body reaction like graft versus host reaction or hypersensitivity reactions. Bowman's membrane is a strong layer that pro provides a scaffold and. Uh, growing epithelium and uh, regenerating nerves it also facilitate epithelialization and stabilize the ocular surface the main outcome measures and upsides of this surgical modality are fast wound healing strengthen the weakened cornea by increasing thickness maintaining the corneal contour significant visual improvement amelioration of symptom surgery process is quite simple short smaller learning curve less invasive less painful suture less and less trade related complication and all therapeutic grade corneas are required in the start surgery uh, corneal scraping done uh, stain with refined blue dye then stromal emphysema created then partial refination done bowman's membrane is separating by using blunt and sharp dissection then bowman's membrane peeled and cut with corneal scleral seizure then conjunctival resection is done with help of corneal scleral seizure cauterization of vessels then making a recess under the anterior one third of stroma and bowman's membrane fashioned up according to size of defect then tucked under the ulcer margin and a recess and bcl put for quicker epithelialization in left side this is another video in right side uh, we can see ocular surface stability uh, post operatively all patients were prescribed eye drop moxifloxacin eye drop uh, carboxymethyl cellulose eye drop atropine sulfate oral steroid and said vitamin c doxycycline and all patients were followed on post op day 1 week 1 to 4 and 3 and 6 month these are the reference thank you Yes sir. Yes sir, it remains stable. Ah, uh, sir, two years. Yes sir. Yes sir, in all cases. Uh, no, how how did you control the inflammation? Ah, uh, ma'am, seventeen to twenty, my God. हाँ एंटीरियर स्ट्रोमा यस मैम
no the mm-hmm. inflammation is the main reason for this the melting uh, like uh, how did you control the inflammation you, you have uh, put a bowman's membrane as a scaffold there and uh, uh, like it has like enhanced the uh, stability of the cornea that, but uh, how did you maintain it like uh, inflammation has to be controlled and how long you have put uh, these patients on steroids post operatively so it provide scaffold and uh, provide a uh, re- uh, region re- uh, growth and conjunctival resection was also done and then uh, it helps in reduce inflammation so so thanks to all we are winding up the session i think before time uh, yeah yeah so i'll i like to announce that the computation and announcement of the results will take um, uh, within 2 hours and you can uh, contact the scientific committee office for the results so kindly the presenters can you come forward for a quick photo So thank you for a good session lot of learning points and innovations thanks a lot